Right, good to go. Uh, you guys can hear me in the back, right? Right, brilliant. So today, uh, on our continued quest to you know understand the business domain we are in, uh, right? As a company, as Cisco, as um, Cisco Labs, I would say uh, this is a progression of you know what we were trying to understand the industry, you know, in more detail. Hasita uh, took us through uh, Cisco in general uh, as a business, as food services business. And today, uh, I thought you know we'll focus a bit on the U.S. restaurant industry, which is uh, the primary uh, customer for us in a way. I mean, if you talk about food services, I would say majority of the business is in restaurants, uh, not necessarily in hospitals or other type of you know uh, food uh, offerings. So this is primarily our customer in different fronts. Now, for example, as Cake Co. Obviously, you know, this is the domain that we are catering to, uh, products, to services, to operations, to all of that. Uh, and then from um, CX side, the uh, customer experience side on Cisco, again, you know, this is the primary customer that we are delivering things to. So it's important to, I think, have a very good understanding of uh, what the industry is, what, what it, where it is going, you know, that sort of uh, analysis. And again, this is a high level overview, guys. Uh, some of this. Uh, like anything that you're trying to understand or, or understand in detail, uh, you have to look at uh, stats and numbers, right? And generally, stats and numbers are boring, so uh, you have to bear with me, unfortunately, right? Uh, so, what are we going to talk about? We're going to look at general industry overview, you know, in terms of some of the concepts that are out there, the different types of restaurants and stuff like that, you know, just basics. Again, bear with me. I'm, I know most of you guys know this. But to, you know, just to put it into context, let's have a kind of an overview of what are we talking about when it comes to restaurant industry. Uh, moving on to uh, the consumer side of things, the customer's customer. So in terms of quality of restaurant, you know, what do the customers expect, you know, from a consumer point of view? So we're going to focus a bit on the quality dimensions. Um, a, f a bit of a focus on the industry trends. Now, this is where things get interesting, right? I mean, in terms of what's actually happening in the general industry in US uh, and try to put that into perspective uh, in terms of trends. And last bit, of course, is what is relevant to us in terms of technology. How are we going to you know how, what are the trends or what are the drivers behind technology adoption in uh, restaurants in US, right? So those are the four areas that uh, we're going to focus on. Most of these stats and numbers, I mean, before I start off, I need to mention this, come from various different sources, right? Um, have you guys heard about NRA? I'm sure you guys have heard about NRA, which is not the famous NRA. There's another NRA in the US, which is the National Restaurant Association, not the National Rifle Association. Um, so these guys actually do a lot of research on uh, the US, US food services industry or the restaurant industry. So some of my, uh, I think most of my data is from, uh, from them. And then, of course, the US uh, census data as well as there are lots of companies who do uh, specifically focus on market research for food services industry, uh, about trends and you know surveys and a lot of material that are out there, uh, as well as some of this information is from our competitors as well. I'm again, publicly you know available information, not that I've gone behind their back or whatever. So as whenever, wherever possible, I have put down the source as well. But if you want to get to more details, please you know, come and talk to me afterwards. We'll, we'll, I'll give you the full sources list, right? So let's dive into it. Uh, industry overview. Um, so as you guys know, I mean, US history doesn't go beyond, I mean, three, four, five hundred years in terms of the modern history that we know of, right? So the oldest uh, restaurant on record in US, which is still operational, is in Rhode Island. Uh, started in nine, uh, 1673, and it's a family business running still. Um, and from those, I guess, you know, humble beginnings, uh, they have evolved quite a bit, uh, close to, you know, more than million plus restaurants in, in the you know, continent US, right? But before we actually look at industry in terms of the, the, uh, 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 the breakdown, it's important to understand some of the interesting concepts, including the types of restaurants. Now again, bear with me, these are basic stuff. You know there are different, uh, re different restaurant types by concept, right? Fine dining is you know, where you sit down, get good quality food, you pay a 
thumping premium price for it, but a better service and so on and so forth. Then the opposite end of that is fast food, right? Where, you, where convenience is the key, you know, fast food delivered to you or taken up uh, quite fast. The newer concept uh, which is coming up, which is the fast casual segment. As the name means, you know, it, it borrows from fast food as well as from a more uh, a casual dining experience where, you know, it, it's kind of trying to give you best of both worlds. Uh, so those kind of restaurants, I mean, examples are like things like Subway or wherever. You, you have a lot more options uh, compared to fast food maybe uh, in that context. You have uh, family style casual dining restaurants that, that it's, you know, sit down sort of concept. You sit down, you have your meals. Uh, in a more family friendly or in a more uh, group friendly atmosphere with more services. You have the cafes and bistros, right? I mean, this is again straightforward. You know your cafes where you get the coffee and whatever other snacks and stuff. Bistros go a little further and offer maybe a few more food choices in that context, right? So those slight differences. You know the food trucks. Again, this is not a concept that we have that much in uh, Sri Lanka, unfortunately. But in US, it's gaining popularity, you know, where you can have food right around the corner. So food trucks concept. The buffets, we all know what the buffets are, right? We love them. Uh, and then you have, sometimes you have types of like pop-up restaurants in like a, like a location, let's say you have a market or wherever, you pop up a location, you have a restaurant going on. So different concepts, guys. Again, this is not limited to these concepts. I mean, there are different types of restaurants, uh, different niche type of restaurants across the board all over the place in US. So these are some of the main stuff which I you know, wanted to bring down. Broadly speaking, uh, these break down into two concepts. One is basically the limited service restaurants. Again, terminologies which you guys have heard quite often, I'm sure. People talk about QSRs and LSRs and you know, this is what they're talking about. Limited service restaurants that the name uh, kind of implies, uh, the differences are in this. So you have, for example, uh, in a limited service restaurant, your menu choices will be limited, as the name suggests. Whereas on the more uh, full service restaurants, you might have a little more choices available. Uh, things like uh, table services or not. On a fast food or limited service restaurant, you will have, you know, uh, from the counter self-service type of, you know, uh, operation. Whereas on a more full service restaurant, there'll be waiters, there'll be, you know, ordering, there'll be, you know, uh, serving as well. And then things like ingredients of choice, uh, whereas in, in, in more full service restaurants, you'll have more focus on better quality, better branded, you know, stuff, if, if you know what I mean. What are the examples? Uh, these are some of the, you know, uh, examples of different chains that are there in US. So you, some of them is quite familiar, right? McDonald's and Burger King, they're all, they're here as well. Uh, so the, these are chain restaurants which offer fast food, whereas uh, fast casual where you have a little bit more, you know, menu choices, maybe a little more modifiers, maybe cooked in a more uh, open sort of kitchen where you can see what's going on. Uh, these are some of the examples and Subway again, again something that we can relate to. Uh, Caves and pizzerias, you know, Starbucks too, you know, uh, anybody who's been to US will know they are all over the place, uh, different pizzerias and, you know, Starbucks and all of that. On the more full service side, you have casual dining. It's an up and coming concept where you have more menu choices as well as, you know, you might sit down and, you know, have your meals in peace rather than compared to the limited service concept that is there. And then uh, family dining, of course, is in a more family, uh, a, a more group oriented way where more sharing is actually, you know, you can actually do that. Um, and also, uh, uh, they are more, uh, they are open, I think, you know, more conveniently open during morning hours, you know, as well as, you know, maybe in the late night. For example, IHOPs, uh, whenever I go to Houston, there's IHOP close by, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, you can just drop in and have your pancakes and, you know, uh, enjoy. So, different types of concepts. And then the last segment, of course, is fine dining. Again, this is where you pay real attention to, you know, uh, detail uh, in terms of cost you know, sort of meals uh, where you have to, you know, spend big bucks, unfortunately, right? Um, so in terms of trends, fast casuals are gaining market share, you know, in terms of concept, people want to, people like that fast food concept, right? I mean, you want to get that convenience of getting the food quickly and, you know, having your meal. At the same time, it can be coupled with certain other stuff that we can borrow from a full service restaurant. So this is gaining market share and fast food has to adjust now. 
uh, we'll talk about some of these trends later on down the line. Um, so in terms of how they actually trying to change and adapt to the new market conditions, right? Um, sales by in the industry sales in terms of uh, full service restaurants and limited service restaurants. As you can see, there's a we don't know even split, but then again, full service restaurants has more sales in terms of the revenue number, right? Whereas uh, there are lots of others, other people, you know, as well in this uh, breakdown in terms of cafes and pizzerias and so on and so forth. But generally, these two dominate the sales volumes in, in US uh, markets. A uh, few interesting facts. More than seven out of 10 restaurants in US are single unit operations. That is independent, maybe mostly independent sort of restaurants. Um, they belong. They don't belong to a chain. There are no multiple restaurants. This one single restaurant. The sales of a full-time equivalent employee in 2016 they generate per employee. How much of sales do you do? Do about eighty thousand dollars a year. Whereas, on average sales, a full-service restaurant does about million dollars a year of sales. Versus a, a, a quick-service restaurant does about eight hundred sixty thousand uh, revenue in terms of sales. Much. Put this into perspective in terms of the industry itself in US. So these are all the different industries that are there in US in terms of their actual um, capitalization or basically the, the amount of revenue they generate or sales they generate, right? So among all of these different industries, the food services and drinking places is about $765 billion big, right? This is in 2016. The prediction is that by 2017 to 18, it will grow to beyond $800 billion. To put that into perspective, our entire GDP of Sri Lanka is about $81 billion. The food services industry in US is close to 10 times bigger than our entire GDP, guys. So just to you know, get the sense of the industry volume and the size in US, right? So this is the opportunity that we have. This is the market that we are going after. Um, some other interesting facts in terms of uh, the consumer side of things. Um, the food, uh, the share of food dollar is an indicator of how much money uh, a person spends. Say, let's say they are spending $100 uh, for food. Out of that, how much is spent at a restaurant, right? In 1955, that was about 25% of your overall food. Let's say you're spending the entire year, for example, the food that you eat, I mean, you have to eat now at the end of the day. So the entire budget that you have for food, you spend about 25% of that at a restaurant. By in the past 70 years, it has grown from 25% to about 48%, almost 50%. Almost 50% of the money that you spend in your food is spent at a restaurant. Um, uh, in terms of you know consumer behavior, nine out of ten people want to go to a restaurant. I mean, which is it's a given fact, right? I mean, we all like going to a restaurant, sitting down and eating nice uh, food, right? Instead of cooking at home. I, I I don't know whether most of you guys cook at home. Cook at home? No. So uh, nobody likes it. So nine out of ten people like eating at restaurants. Two out of five consumers say uh, restaurants are essential part of their lifestyle uh, in U.S. Seven out of ten. Uh, say their favorite restaurant food, they can't replicate at home. Uh, so that's naturally the drive for people to go to a restaurant or order it from you know, online or get it delivered or whatever reason, they can't replicate this at home. Uh, so that's the catch. Uh, eight in ten consumers say dining out with family and friends is an enjoyable experience that they want to do it. Uh, so this is the drive that mm, propels the you know restaurant industry to go further. I would say, but again there are not. It's not without challenges. To put this into perspective from annual spending point of view, um, the biggest expense for a US consumer or US uh, 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 diner is housing. You know, in terms of the amount of money that they spend totally throughout a year, they spend about 33% in housing. Transportation comes next, and food is the third category on average. They spend to about 12% of their annual expenditure on food, right? Interesting stats. Uh, so again, more stats. 
I guess I don't have a choice uh, to go to it. This is from an employment point of view. Who actually works in restaurants, right? So in 2007, there are about 12.5 million employees employed in restaurant industry, a number which is currently at about 1.5 million uh, work, uh, basically employees, predicted to grow to about 16.3 by 2027, right? Again, put it into perspective, our entire population is about 21 million in our country. About 15 to 16 million people working in US food industry itself. The, the interesting part here is that half of adults in US, they claim that they have uh, worked in a restaurant at some point in their lives. Uh, can I sh sh a show of hands, anybody here who has worked in a restaurant before? There is one in the back, two, three, including myself. So that number is drastically different from our experience to US, where you know people work on a part-time basis or while they are studying, you know, in some context they, they work in some you know environment or some restaurant or the other. I was just talking to Eric a uh, few minutes back. He said I worked uh, just folding napkins, you know, when he was little, just worked in just to fold the napkins. You know, that's that's how things work. Uh, sometimes you find some job. No, I did uh, part-time work for a cafe called um, Komalas. I don't know whether some of the new generation would not know. There was a fast food joint, not a fast food joint. It's like a, a chain restaurant uh, in Union Place called Komalas, serving uh, Indian food. They obviously went bankrupt. Uh, I worked there, you know, uh, but not my fault, of course. <laughs> I worked only there for a month and uh, that was because, you know, my parents didn't give me enough money to smoke. So, 30 bucks an hour, you know, you have to just, you know, do a few things here and there. So, the point is, that is different in US. In US, you know, people take it up. Uh, it's not looked down upon. I mean, obviously, you have some, if you have some time, some capacity, you go and work in a restaurant. Because this last stat is very important, guys. This is the single biggest challenge that they have in US is finding the people to work in the restaurant industry. So that's why the, the industry you know, rates that as the biggest challenge that they have. Um, and also, uh, one in three Americans, they say that they, their first job was in a restaurant. And another interesting fact is that, unlike other industries where now, say for example, you become a software engineer, you finish your studies, you get your degree, then you become a software engineer, and then you immediately, you know, come into as a software engineer, or, you know, start working like that. Whereas in the restaurant industry, most of the people work or, or start work at the ground level. So even that is true in Sri Lanka as well. So for example, if you are joining a hotel or a restaurant or whatever, you will start off as the uh, room boy, or you know, some very at the bottom level itself, and then work your way through, you know, uh, different levels. So that is the same in in U.S. restaurant industry as well. 1810 owners have started at the ground level by folding napkins. So Eric is also going to open up a restaurant down the line at some point, I'm sure. So the idea is that they start off at the bottom, they work their way, and they open restaurants at the end of the day. Uh, and 9 in 10 restaurant managers, again, have that experience. They know what happens in the ground level. It's not like you may become a manager you know, after your degree or whatever. You start off at the ground level, you understand the industry, understand what happens in the restaurant, and then progress your way through. So some interesting stats uh, when it comes to that. Um, and also, 9 out of uh, 10 restaurants, or 90% of restaurants, have less than 50 you know, employees working. So small scale from a comparison point of view, right? Uh, what else? Again, this upper part is not that visible, unfortunately. This is kind of, uh, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics in US, the level of education uh, for restaurant employees uh, as of 2016, I believe. One, it, one thing very important is this, so this is the less than high school education. There's about 20% of the segment, less than uh, high school education, I believe. And there's about another 38% who are high school graduates. The basic college, you know, uh, school, you know, uh, background, and then the rest of us only have the two-year and the four-year bachelor degree type of, you know, education. So again, another fact that indicates that there'll be a lot of people starting. Their first job might be, you know, uh, working in a restaurant. 
so it's an industry which is focused like that. I mean, you have a lot of turnover as well as people starting off going through, right? Um, another interesting fact is 40% of the workforce is part-time. Um, they don't work full-time in restaurants um, because, you know, there are good tips and, you know, obviously you have multiple free time. You can go and work as a part-timer in a restaurant, which is double uh, the average for any other industry in U.S. Uh, comparatively. It's uh, another interesting fact. Last bit about the restaurant industry KPIs. Now, when I'm, I'm talking about key performance indicators, that talks about what is restaurant success. What do restaurants look for to be successful? What are the different aspects that they look for? Um, cash flow, which is basic, right? I mean, like any other industry, cash flow, any other business, cash is one of the most important things. If you don't have cash, you will go bankrupt very soon because you have to pay your bills at the end of the day. And restaurants have added burden where you have sometimes seasonal you know, uh, variations. Say, during summer, for example, people will step out uh, in, in, of course, colder states. Uh, during summer only, people will step out and go to restaurants. Whereas, uh, because you don't want to strap on all those you know, layers and then go to a restaurant, right? So naturally, uh, there'll be seasonal flows, as well as the time flow, as in like say during lunch you will have a huge volume or dinner, whatever, and then you have a period of, you know, uh, relative uh, lull, I would say. So in that context, cash flow management is very important for a restaurant. They need to know when I have to pay my bills as well as when I'm going to get the money. So this is why whenever there's funding delays or whatever, you guys get woken up. Uh, this is the reason, because for them, cash at hand is very important that realization, right? Uh, next one is revenue per available seat hour. So this is kind of like a formula that they look for. It's basic concept again. So you have your seating capacity. Uh, how much money does per seat per hour that you're making? It's an indication of how successful you are as a restaurant, right? So you want to maximize this. You want to maximize the available capacity and make revenue out of that. So during obviously busy periods, they want to increase the prices or generate more, you know, revenue uh, or decrease the meal duration. If somebody is sitting and without going, you know, just taking up the seat, that means, you know, he's eating into your available seat capacity in a way. So how do you get him out of the door, you know, quickly as possible? That doesn't mean you chase him out. But how do you make sure you provide food maybe faster? How do you, you know, put, serve, give services faster? On slow periods, obviously, you want to attract more customers. So this is another indicator for success for uh, restaurants in US, or any, for that matter, any any uh, restaurant all over the world. Employee turnover is another key KPI in that context, right? Remember, we talked about this. This is the single biggest factor, the challenge that you know restaurants face. So they need to obviously be mindful of that turnover, and it takes. So this is an again an average, which talks about it. They have to spend about six thousand, almost six thousand dollars to uh, recruit somebody, train somebody, and you know uh, get them to be productive. On average, they have to spend about six thousand additional dollars. Why is it a problem? Because there is a whopping seventy-two percent sort of you know turnover in the uh, restaurant industry, right? That means, say you have ten employees uh, that you start off your business with. One year down the line, seven to eight of them have left, right? So it's a big challenge for uh, uh, restaurants as well as something that they want to obviously keep track of it and you know obviously uh, track the employee turnover. Next one, prime costs. Prime costs talk about two things. One is the cost of goods sold. So naturally as a restauranter, you would want to know how much did I actually purchase uh, over the last month versus you know how much actually, uh, what is the cost of goods sold. Uh, and then the second part is the payroll. How much did you pay your employees to, you know, uh, to generate whatever revenue number? So those two things are important uh, from a restaurant point of view to know your prime costs. How much did you spend on your cost of goods sold on purchasing as well as how much you uh, are earning per employee expense, right? So prime costs are another key KPI for restaurants. Fifth one, menu item profitability. This talks about, now you have different types of menu uh, offerings, right? different types of dishes. Each of those dishes, you have to figure out 
what is my menu item profitability? So per that item, how much of money am I making? What is the cost that it takes you know, for me to make this item versus how much am I making out of this item? So naturally, if you have something which is higher, you would want to promote that item and sell more, right? Whereas if, I mean, they have to look at the number of items as well. So it's not like you do this per item, you do it for the number of items that you sell versus how much of cost that you have you know, done, uh, taken up to make those items. Sixth and the last one is customer satisfaction. You know, this is again something not as much as you know quantitative as the other formulas. How do you gauge customer satisfaction? So in increasingly, in restaurants want to kind of put this into perspective. How satisfied are my customers? There are few channels that they can do this. I mean, some of them they offer the you know uh, customer satisfaction surveys, right? I'm sure you guys have filled it at some point in your life, even in Sri Lanka. As well as there are lots of online material. Uh, so, for example, this is very interesting. Where on Yelp.com is one of the I don't know whether you guys have seen this site. I'm sure most of you have at some point. Uh, is one of the key sites for reviewing restaurants, and half a star difference, let's say from 3.5 to 4 stars, um, creates 19% on average more sales for you. Um, so that's how important reviews have become. I mean, we see that in our own uh, lives as well, right? I mean, say for example, if, if I'm ordering something on Amazon or whatever, I search for the product. One of the filters that I'll use is four stars above. So all the other products that for, you know, doesn't fit into four stars above, I will not even see, for example. So that similar concept applies in Yelp as well. When you're searching and going and looking for restaurants, this has a huge impact uh, in that context. So customer satisfaction has a huge role to play in customer uh, or restaurant you know uh, performance right so far with me all right uh, that's industry overview in terms of what the US restaurant industry is half of my work is done let's focus on the uh, quality dimensions from a customer consumer point of view what do the consumers look for when, when it comes to quality of a restaurant right again basic stuff common sense uh, this breaks down into uh, actually uh, traditional and you know you know the traditional parameters right food quality all of that are traditional parameters let's look at them and then there are few things that are coming up because of things like millennials uh, things like evolution of technology and so on there are new things that are coming up so traditional factors are quite straightforward right food quality quality of service the physical environment and price fairness we can all relate to this whenever we select a restaurant or whatever we naturally will look for Food quality, the tastiness, the variety, nutrition, food presentation, how nicely the food comes out to you. A lot of us you know, now take photos and put in Instagram and all of that. So all of that is important. These are traditional stuff. Service quality, very important, again, uh, for a full service restaurant especially, where how employees are knowledgeable about the food. Can they answer my questions? You know, can they recommend dishes to me? Things like that, as well as the attentive, you know, they, they look after you, all of those traditional parameters still matter. Physical environment, again, important, uh, especially, uh, you know, the presentation where, you know, you will not go to a restaurant which is, you know, which has garbage all over the place. So, you know, the presentation of, or the environment is not up to your expectations, right? So, decor to lighting to ambience to entertainment to all of that comes under this. Price fairness, of course, doesn't, uh, I mean, everything has a price. So at the end of the day, am I spending good money? Nobody wants to waste money, right? So naturally, you know, they look for good value for money. Uh, am I getting the uh, experience, not just the food, the experience that I crave for the money that I spend, right? So traditional uh, aspects. There are changes happening though, in terms of perceived quality uh, when it comes to restaurants. Uh, people want to, you know, understand uh, or perceived quality is very important, right? Quality is a, uh, it's not a co quantitative factor. You, I mean, you can't, it's difficult to quantify quality in a way. Quality is what you feel. So what are the new trends? Uh, about 79% diners agree that technology makes their experience, dining experience better. So these are based on surveys. What are the technologies we are talking about? Things like having online ordering to, uh, uh, free Wi-Fi at you know at your restaurant to various other factors. We look at some of those technology aspects down the line, but they believe that 79% of them, 79% of them believe technology makes a difference uh, in terms of their experience. 
40% consumers, they want diet specific stuff, naturally, right? I mean, we are, as a generation, as a, as a uh, human uh, civilization now, we are very conscious about our figure and our health and everything. So diet specific stuff, obviously, naturally, they focus on. 60% of consumers uh, want environment friendly stuff. This is again the consciousness that is coming through with regards to environment. In terms of suppliers, are they following best practices? Uh, am I eating, you know, free range organic chicken versus a chicken that is, you know, grown in a cage, which is like one feet at, you know, one feet dimension or whatever. So we are conscious about the environmental aspects. 68% uh, consumers are likely to visit a restaurant which offers locally produced food. What does that mean? Fresh food, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's what it means. If it's locally produced, then it will be in your plate sooner. That's the idea at least behind it. So they will prefer something which is locally, pre uh, locally uh, prepared. And for example, 47% of these guys are now conscious about where their chicken comes from, right? I mean, for us, it doesn't really uh, cross our minds, but do you guys realize the modern chicken only lives for about only 23 to 25 days from being a chick to your plate. Um, so there's a lot of growth hormones and various things that I think we are eating. But increasingly, the, uh, the US consumer is aware of it. Uh, so they want to know where is it coming from. Uh, is it coming from organic or free range sort of chicken and so on and so forth. This is something that I think we can relate to as well. We are also now used to this. We browse for food online. And the visual representation of your food, you know, is very important at the end of the day. When you see a dish, even at a restaurant, right, uh, the chance that, you know, you look at an image and pick that particular dish is high. Even if it's available on a printed menu, uh, you will look at that dish and uh, it'll, something will trigger in your mind whether you like that dish or not, right? Again, 54% uh, will pay more for premium brands. When I say premium brands, the mentality is that, you know, there's more attention given to the preparation of it. Uh, so the big brands hopefully will focus more on the quality. And that's why they, they spend quite a bit, uh, the big brands, the reputed brands, to maintain their brand uh, loyalty, to maintain that the quality that they offer, they spend quite a lot. Because people crave, people will pay extra for that. Uh, the momentum when it comes to, uh, so this, this whole set of trends that we just talked about goes into a little more perspective when it comes to chain versus independent restaurants. You guys know what a chain restaurant versus independent restaurant is, right? Uh, so for example, KFC is a chain restaurant, whereas um, this guy, uh, Burger, Burgers King, not Burger King, there was a joint called Burgers King. I think they're rebranded now, I think, afterwards. That's an independent restaurant, uh, right? So that's the difference there. In terms of revenue, of course, uh, the chain restaurants have more revenue. But in terms of the number of restaurants in US, it's actually independent restaurants have more restaurants, more, more number of units out there. But from a growth point of view, this is something that I think for us, which is kind of important. The expected growth is in independent restaurants because of some of those trends that I talked about. The focus on locally sourced food, the focus on uh, things like you know uh, uh, corporate social responsibility. You feel your close by neighboring you know restaurant is you will have some more loyalty uh, versus a chain restaurant which you see all over the place, right? Uh, so and also the the we'll come to actually some of those uh, breakdown of some why actually this this part is growing, but for us I think this growth prediction is kind of important because this is where. The US industry is going to grow in terms of you know number of restaurants that are out there because number of restaurants matters to us, right? That's number of customers that we can sell our post to, you know, uh, do whatever. But that growth is something that is important. Uh, what are the factors that uh, these guys look for? These are some of the aspects, again, done through surveys by uh, a company called Pentelect, uh, a market research company for food services industry. These are some of the aspects that they surveyed. Things like community orientation, whether it's special type of food, whether it's personalized service, shares my values to all of those different aspects, right? All the way up to here, into menu variety, to value for money, all of those things, the independent restaurants are performing better from a customer point of view. Whereas from a delivery service onwards, use of technology to social media, use to convenient location-wise, 
the chain restaurants are doing better because they have bigger budgets to market themselves, to you know, to do more social media, to to attract more technology. Naturally, they have bigger pockets. This is the reason why the independents are coming up fast because they are customizing their offering. They are giving better value, as in you know, perceived value from a customer point of view, which makes sense, right? But it's not a bumpy, it's not a smooth sailing all the way. There are challenges ahead for them. Uh, in US, naturally, the the prices for uh, wages are getting higher. So the, the natural, the, the standard salary, there are legislations coming up, minimum wages and stuff. I know we don't have that in Sri Lanka, I believe. I don't think we have a concept called minimum wage. But in US, there's a concept called minimum wage. And those are going higher. Uh, in that context, obviously, their uh, labor costs are going to go higher. Skyrocketing rents and, you know, naturally, like in Sri Lanka, the rents, the, the property prices are going up. Uh, Compared to a chain restaurant, which have bigger pockets, uh, uh, independent restaurant will have to manage these challenges, uh, which affect them quite uh, hard. Again, I will not spend a lot of time here. Uh, this non-traditional channel expansion, we'll talk about that somewhere down the line. Right. So far with me? Let's look at some of the industry trends, right? Again. What I want to specially talk about is things that affect us as a business. Again, there's lots of trends, a lot of information out there. I mean, I don't have the time nor the need to you know, digest all of that, right? We'll focus on what affects us. Rise of non-traditional channels. This is specially talking about the trends that are taking place in the US restaurant industry, which is affecting, uh, these are not traditional stuff. These are new things that are either coming from having technology that enables it, or the new generation who are more tech savvy or more demanding or more environmentally conscious and so on and so forth, right? So what are the trends? Uh, entertainment at home, with things like Netflix to you know on-demand TV to various other facilities that you have at home now, rather than having to go visit a restaurant, you might order something online and consume it with your friends at home while watching a movie at home, for example. So that's a new trend that is actually, you know, taking pace. Trend two, you want to align your belief system with your brands, right? I mean, if you feel that, uh, I mean, I can relate to this. For example, I don't know whether you guys were around at this stage when uh, when Nespray had some, one of the milk brands had some issue where there was some contaminant or something. To this day, I will not purchase Nespray. It's, it's stuck in my head, right? I mean, uh, for something, you know, you have to align your values with your brand's values in a way. That naturally happens. So that is another trend that is happening, taking place. Uh, big brands, there's a backlash against them uh, in terms of what they spend, what they stand for, uh, how they have, you know, kind of environmental policies to how they make, you know, other businesses go away to whatever the reason, there's a bit of a backlash against big brands. Um, the fourth one, Everything is about convenience now. You know, how can I have it on demand whenever, wherever I want, right? I mean, you guys can relate to it as well. When you want to have some food, you want it now. You don't want to go looking for it and, you know, all over the place. Um, and this is something that is again coming up, uh, having on demand type of uh, food. And the segments are kind of blurring across the board. So traditionally, there was a restaurant. You have to go there, eat there, and, you know, you're done. Now you have food uh, courts, you know, all over the place. Say, even if you go to a supermarket, there might be a, a place that, you know, offer food. Um, so, I mean, there are the lines between restaurant industry and maybe the supermarkets. Those are kind of blurring uh, where, you know, you, where you actually access your food. Again, it comes down to convenience. Trend six, automation. Again, this is where we are focusing on, right? From AI to uh, chatbots to online ordering to automation to burger flipping robots to whatever that we talk about, you know, automation is here. That's a new trend that, that, that is the future, right? And the last one, of course, is uh, legalization of things like marijuana. Uh, increasingly, states are, you know, legalizing some of this. It doesn't mean that, you know, people who, you know, who are high will go and eat more. That's not what I'm talking about. The trend, you know, uh, the trend of, you know, actually things that were taboo before, now are opening up, which blends, you know, lines at the end of the day in terms of restaurant industry as well. So how does this reflect on numbers again? 
44% um, customers will uh, say their sales price is taken as takeaway and consumed some off premises. It's not prim uh, consumed at uh, the restaurant itself. 21% consumers uh, deliver, I mean, basically from a LSR point of view, limited service restaurant point of view, where there's not a lot of is to eat and all of that, will take the food and go, you know, eat at a convenient place. 50% uh, of diners purchase restaurants, uh, what they purchase as restaurants, dinner, basically, they will consume at home. Uh, again, something that we can relate to as well. We usually on our way back home or whatever, we'll pick up food and, you know, we'll go and consume it at home. On average, about 5.5 times, again, close to 6 times, you call and get things delivered in US. Uh, when I say food, you know, delivery wise, you will on average for a week, you place about six uh, delivery orders, right? Uh, and spend about $32 on average per a week for third party delivery companies. Things where you can, I mean, it's not the restaurant which is delivering, you are getting a third party to deliver your food from your restaurant, right? Something that we can relate to. I mean, we were trying out this with Cake Connect as well at some point. Um, and 25% of all of uh, premise orders are for delivery. So the point here is that delivery and consumption is on the rise. Uh, online ordering to delivery services to paying, you know, in various mechanisms and so on and so forth. The convenience part of it is on the rise. Something that we can all relate to from our experience as well. Right. The millennials uh, obviously is a big chunk of uh, restaurant industry influencers. The reason are these bottom two stats, right? Comparatively, 53% of millennials want to hang out with their friends, you know, in restaurants. Um, whereas, from a family point of view, they prefer going out with their family to a restaurant, 58%. And what is important about it is that they get to choose the restaurant to go into. Right? So this is something that I can relate myself as well. Now, even though my daughter is only four and a half years, when you say, let's go out, she has a say in you know what restaurant she wants to go to, from my experience point of view. Right? That's just very young. But at the same time, what I'm trying to say is, millennials have a lot of say in family affairs. Uh, so that's another trend that we need to, I guess, you know, take into account as well. And this one also is kind of interesting. 20% don't want to interact with humans. They prefer, you know, talking to a chatbot or, you know, using an online ordering or a kiosk, you know, where you can go and place your self-order, uh, things like that. They don't want to talk to a human uh, from that perspective. Um, so, free Wi-Fi to, I mean, the industry is getting shaped by the millennials, the new generation. Uh, when I say new generation, we talk about them as Gen Z. I don't know whether I qualify as a new generation, although I did my A-levels in 2000. I guess, you know, most of you guys fall into this category, right? Millennials. And they have a big say in US industry, a food industry. These are some of the biggest challenges the restaurant is facing. So I have, in terms of percentage. So again, taken from one of our competitors, you know, uh, surveys, where they talk about, the, we, we talked about this. Most of the restaurants, or 36.3% restaurant, uh, percent restaurants say, Finding the right people and training them and staffing is the biggest challenge that they have. Whereas 19.6 talk about attracting and remaining customers. Uh, tough competition, 7.6. High operating food costs, again, about another 15%. Uh, understanding my restaurant mix, that's talking about the offering that you're making, the, the menu choices and stuff, that's a challenge. Uh, another 6.6. ,6. What is more important and interesting here, which, I, which puzzles me, is that only 2% think technology is their biggest challenge, right? Which means the industry is ready for technology. Industry is, although it's not been adopted at the same rate as the consumers are demanding it, they don't perceive it as a problem. Uh, they feel that, you know, they can stay up to date with the technology. It's not their biggest problem, right? Because there are lots of services at companies that offer these services to these restaurants now. So that's where we have to compete uh, in that context. Right, uh, industry trends, so far with me. I know a lot of numbers, guys. I mean, again, as I said, you know, uh, I have no choice. Say, if you go to a doctor, you know, 
nowadays, you know, you have to get all these reports, right? It's, it's it just become a numbers game. You look at those these stats and to understand your sickness. So similarly, to understand the restaurant industry, we have to look at numbers. No choice, right? So bear with me. Last bit. Technology. Um, so this is a known fact. 73% of the restaurant goers, as in the diners, think technology improves their own experience, right? Whereas 95% of the restaurants think technology improves their own operation. So this is the sphere we are in, right? I mean, this is the opportunity we are talking about. Almost all of the restaurants think using technology, they can improve their whatever challenges that they're facing, from retaining staff to their operational costs. So remember the KPIs that we talked about, cash flow to uh, their number of seats, the reservations to all of that. Through technology, it can be increased or enhanced. And also the customers believe that as well, right? I've done enough talking. I think I'll just uh, have a bit of a video, which I think you know we'll talk about the trends in more detail, so I can take a small break. Uh, so we'll have a look at that. This is again put together by uh, NRA uh, in terms of the technology trends. There are some important facts there, so pay attention. things that you need to I guess you know focus on uh, there was a uh, focus on the fact that you know restaurants are spending money now they, they want to catch up uh, they want to be at the leading edge not lagging in terms of other restaurants so naturally they want to spend more and they're willing to because uh, uh, there are some other stats as well we'll come to that but the idea is that there's an opportunity um, a restaurant is a chaotic environment right anybody who has worked in a restaurant would know it's a chaotic environment you know you have customers from one end kitchen on the other end kitchen is one of the hottest environments to work in right if you ever been to a kitchen you'll know the, the the cooks are not in a good mood while they are working you know because you know it's a it's a difficult environment there's a lot of pressure because the orders you know come at a specific time during lunch and dinner and stuff so it's a chaotic environment and like all chaos there's opportunities uh, for us to you know go in and improve some of the interesting uh, ideas that they want to look at is automation. More automation in terms of uh, things that they want to deliver, like drone delivery and stuff, to you know uh, things like you know uh, being able to price uh, items depending on demand or depending on time, for example. Uh, so those are some of the features they feel that you know can use in the future, based on not my research, but based on NRA's research, right? So a few things that you can you know take from that uh, presentation. A um, few things that I want to highlight is, this is again a survey done by Toast, uh, which talks about some of the uh, parameters or technology parameters, or technology offerings, from both restaurant point of view and the diner's point of view. 
right? So the idea is, for example, online ordering, uh, close to 30% restaurants say that is very important for them. And another about close to 30% says that somewhat important. You understand the idea? So each offering that is there, so there is online ordering. I know it's difficult to see in the back, but bear with me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So there's online ordering, loyalty program, gift card programs, uh, handheld tablets, handheld devices in the restaurant environment, uh, tabletop tablets, we're talking about you know where you can browse the menus and stuff, tabletop tablets, uh, self-ordering kiosks, mobile pay, online reservations, not online ordering, online reservations, uh, and then guest Wi-Fi. These are some other traditional technology offerings that you know when it comes to restaurants we talk about, right? So this is a comparison between diners and how diners perceive these ideas versus how the restaurants feel about it. And one thing they both think that is important in common is these three. Online ordering, loyalty, and then uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, which both restaurants and diners think are important. Whereas uh, online reservations, from a, diner, from a diner's point of view, is important. But restaurants don't really go after this. So this is kind of bad news for guest manager folks, I suppose. But then again, you know, it's, it's something that uh, Naturally, when the consumers demand it, the industry has to catch up, right? So uh, I think it's something that will come in the future. So again, I won't go into too much details. It's a comparison that anybody who wants to digest later on, I'll, I'll put down the source as well. So it's all about convenience at the end of the day, right? So from a diner's point of view, they want to, you know, 90% of diners will full uh, meal uh, will pay for full meal using credit or debit card over cash in US compared to us. They don't really carry cash anymore, right? So it's 90% of the consumers, they want to pay through credit card, debit cards. 83% say that online reservations are very important or somewhat important to them. Again, the fact that we talked about good news for guest manager, in a way, I suppose there's an opportunity. 63% uh, of diners are interested in table side payment terminals or devices. Another trend that is taking shape, as well as 39% smartphone users, they want to use, uh, they would like to pay their bar tabs and restaurant tabs, for example, using mobile pay, uh, another opportunity that is there. So to put that into perspective, this is something that they looked at from a, again, a survey point of view. 81% of the customers, at some point, they have used the restaurant's website to place online orders, right? Whereas about 52% percent of them, they have used online ordering aggregate site. You know, there are sites that put together online, say, different restaurants, you can order online from one site, right? And then you have in-house built or custom built apps, which you can place orders through. So different percentages that reflect that, you know, how things are shaping up. Naturally, this is an area which will take even more precedence now. The reason is, uh, naturally, the, the smartphone usage, right? We'll come back to that separately. What is the restaurant doing to catch up? A uh, few things. 70%, 78% of restauranters look at their daily matrices, the sales, the, you know, the reports, the, the customer surveys, various things. So this is where, again, for us, we have problems, right? I mean, if they find some discrepancy between a report or whatever, it's a big issue for them. Because they're looking at it on a daily basis. They have to be. And it's a 70% jump from 2015. They're more aware of having to look at their cash flows, having to look at you know, what items are selling, and, and so on and so forth. Whereas uh, one third of restauranters plan to upgrade their post technology within the next one year. Again, very good news for us if we can you know, tap into this. Um, the idea is that they want to keep up to date. They don't want to use their traditional POS anymore. They want, they're looking for more features, more capabilities. Another opportunity that we can uh, pounce upon. This thing, they have not yet caught up the mobile pay uh, part of it. Uh, so if I go into a little more details, from a restaurant point of view, only about 22% restaurants have mobile pay or custom app, you know, payments that they can use, do using mobile pay as such, right? So it's a small number, say 78% don't have that feature available to them. Whereas from a customer point of view, if you look at this, there's close to about 58% customers if it's available to them, they will use they'll use the mobile pay option, right? Again, another opportunity that I think that's something that we are already going after in terms of EME features and stuff. 
uh, this is what we are trying to tap into. So more restaurants increasingly as the customers demand it will have to you know cut over into mobile pay uh, related you know capabilities at the end of the day. Right? So the key to that of course is uh, from 2010 to 2017 there's about 100% increase of smartphone usage. Um, close to 77, so close to 80% of the people are having a smartphone in US, whereas this was only about 35%, you know, five years ago or seven years ago, right? So that's the trend that I think is a key that that triggers the whole um, adoption of mobile pay to app app related payments, right? That's it. <laughs> I've tried to give you a very high level overview through numbers, unfortunately, of what the US food industry stands for. Their revenue, their you know, business models, different concepts from uh, quick service to you know, full service, the different examples, the trends that are behind the, the employment, the trends that are there behind technology, and the consumer, more importantly. What is consumer perceived? Uh, as you know technology or the improvements that they're looking for right so a quick overview um, the sources as I quoted are numerous unfortunately so I haven't listed out everything here if anybody's interested I can certainly share those with you if they want to further look into this and I'm not an expert on restaurant industry in the US but I can take any questions based on my limited knowledge whether I can answer I, ca I can take it up if you guys have any questions